Hi, I'm Ali Patterson and welcome to The Paytech Show. In today's episode, we're going to be learning about the huge changes happening in the payments industry. Massive digitization strategies, buy now, pay later, your grand ordering off Amazon. Never before has there been such a shift in the way people pay for things and the technology is still keeping pace with the abrupt cultural changes caused by COVID-19. To find out more, I brought in some payment specialists from around the world to find out if the fraudsters are finding this new ecosystem a field day or a time to lay low. Dialing in from Munich, we have our resident payment specialist Yuka from GND to give us the lowdown on how tokenization is playing a huge role in shifting the balance of power towards customers in terms of taking back control and also keeping fraudsters at bay. Just for you, the viewers, I get up ridiculously early to speak to our next guest who is dialing in all the way from Australia, Francine from Klarna, a company spearheading new ways to pay. Last but not least, we have Mike Cohen from Mastercard, who gives a masterclass in how payment rails and tokenization will continue to play a huge role in the way people pay for things online. Well, let's uh, let's get straight into it. Can you give us uh, a bit of an insight into how payments has changed as a result of the pandemic and subsequent lockdowns? Yeah, you know, I think um, Australia one of the first to to move into to quite stringent lockdowns, um, shutting down retail stores relatively quickly, which really um, meant that those in and with the digital footprint needed to accelerate the ability to enable customers to continue shopping. Uh, sort of not knowing how long the pandemic was going to be, not knowing how long we would be in different um, stages, if you like, of, of lockdown. So what we've really seen is a massive acceleration uh, into the world of e-commerce. Now, there are some um, amazing retailers that were already very digitally savvy with very strong digital programs that quite seamlessly shifted into gear. But there's a really large proportion that had to actually get down really quickly uh, behind the covers, lift the hood and start making things work so that they could attract and continue to engage with their audiences in a very new and and different way. Um, I think there was a statistic that we saw that last week alone, um, more than 30% of Australians actually did a buy now, pay later transaction online, um, which when you think about sort of 12 months ago, there was only 10% of the Australian population that had actually done a buy now, pay later transaction. So what we've really seen in the in the time of the pandemic is a shift um, in user behaviour as well. And I think that's come about from the fact that people are now at home, so they're able to explore new and different ways to, to pay. We've obviously had a lot of more mature audiences who typically shopped in store um, and have never really worked in, and played in the online sphere. Um, who were thriving on how do I get my fix or how do I get my perfume or my makeup or whatever it might be. And there's this whole new audience now shopping online as well, which is really exciting for um, the space. But I think the thing that was most fascinating for us is to see the response um, from so many retailers. And, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of different retailers and the common theme is very much if we were in a good position, then what this has done is enabled us to accelerate having an even stronger position and where we weren't in the the position that we really wanted to be, it accelerated us to get to a place that we believe we need to be and to continue into the future. Typically speaking, what are some of the biggest fraud issues that banks have had to deal with on the retail side? Um, I mean, I, I think it's probably worth starting by kind of taking a, a bit of a step back and sort of thinking about what, what has happened with fraud over quite a long period of time. So if we go back and always the point of sale to chip and pin, and that had a huge impact. It's largely eliminated, eliminated the problem of card cloning. Um, but the effect of that, of course, is, is that fraud doesn't disappear. It, it moves around and it finds a new home. and e-commerce was the, the natural home for it to find. So, uh, so over that that, the, that that last period of time that we've been fighting this ongoing and ever increasing battle as more and more payments take place online, more and more fraud is attempted online. And that is the real battleground now. From, from a MasterCard perspective, we operate a really kind of simple principle around this, which we call zero liability. And, and the, the basic principle is that if the as, as long as the card holder has exercised reasonable care and as long as if their card is lost or stolen they report it promptly 
then then the card holder will be protected from from fraud arising from you know a lost or stolen card situation for example uh, and that really underpins how how we approach things um so so assuming that a card holder hasn't uh, sorry has acted with reasonable care and reported something promptly if, if they're required to uh, we then have a set of rules that then determine who is liable for that fraud between the bank that issued the card and the bank that acquired the transaction? Uh, there are different, uh, of course, multiple ways to group the fraud. So uh, I guess that there are as many definitions as there are uh, so-called experts in this space. But uh, uh, one rather simple is to probably categorize them to that there is a card related payments. Uh, then there are uh, fraud, which is related more to the identity theft. And then there are things um, or fraud relating to telemarketing uh, type of fraud. Um, if you look at the card fraud, which I think is the very much which is concerning us all, here more in detail. So um, there is a fraud which is related, of course, when you lose your card uh, or it's getting stolen, of course, then people can easily use that one to certain. Uh, um, let's say payment transactions, whether it's a point of sales or on, on the online uh, account takeover. And usually then there is a social engineering uh, being used or uh, phishing uh, type of attacks, uh, which are very common. Um, and then uh, there is, of course, uh, uh, tech, well, I can't call them technologies, but the ways to actually uh, copy your card skimming, which is very much uh, related to MaxDrive cards, where you basically copy your MaxDrive data. And now there are also uh, some attempts uh, for so called, I guess, shimming, which is then that you actually uh, try to uh, copy whatever you have on the chip card. So I think that these are the typical fraud cases that the banks and we as a consumer uh, will confront. What new technologies are being applied to to counteract these new threats? I, I guess so, so. I think there are two aspects to answering that. So, um, I'll talk in a moment about I think some of the technological changes that I kind of touched upon earlier that I think are, are helping to make the transactions themselves more safe. As far as specifically the, the sort of social engineering can, uh, angle is concerned, I think there there are some things that are happening and the banks are able to do on this. So. You know, one example is around uh, payee authentication. So it used to be the case that when you transferred some money from your bank account to somebody else, you just, you were given an account number and you transferred the money to that account number and you didn't know anything more about it. Uh, what we now have in the UK at least is a situation where when you type in that card number, some verification is done around that. So for example, you might be asked to name the person or entity that you are attempting to transfer money to and your bank will flag to you to say, well, this doesn't match the name of the entity or person you're saying you want to transfer money to does not match this account number that you've given to us. Are you sure this is legitimate? So there, there are some of those kinds of things that can be done. On the technology side, I think there are really two key areas of development and this really relates primarily to cards. Uh, which, are, which are, I think, really helping in terms of, of, of uh, making online payment security more robust. So the first one I've already touched upon, strong customer authentication, make sure that making sure it's the legitimate cardholder uh, who is making the payment. The second one is around securing the transaction itself through tokenization. And tokenization is something that, you know, maybe not everybody's familiar with it. Uh, but it's something, it, it, it's on a bit of a journey. It's been going on for a, a little over five years now. It started in the UK back in 2005 with the introduction of the first uh, token, what we call tokenized wallets. So things like Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, and now wearable propositions like Garmin Pay and Fitbit Pay and things like that. And uh, tokenization essentially is two things. It's swapping out the real card number for a surrogate card number, which is only used in certain scenarios. And secondly, cryptographically authenticating the use of that, that, that card number. Um, the, a shorthand version would be, of the second part would be, would be to say, bringing a similar kind of tech, uh, security to the online transaction that we already have at the point of sale when you do a chip and pin transaction, as opposed to a mag transaction, for example. Uh, 
so just sort of continuing on that journey. So, so we, we did. We started by doing the wallets. The, the, the thing that we're kind of right in the middle of now is uh, tokenizing cards that are stored by retailers in their own systems. So tokenized card on file or tokenized credential on file. And then the, the, the final kind of piece of the puzzle is when people type in card numbers online and, and tokenizing that. And, and there's a, a, a standard called secure remote commerce and, and an experience called click to pay. Uh, which through which we seek to address that that last piece of the puzzle uh, and which is really just starting to kick off now in the UK. If a payment is tokenized or a bank uses a disposable virtual card number, for example, is fraud, at least from a technology standpoint, completely removed? Well, uh, I think there is always the fraud risk. So uh, that would be a really a pitfall to believe that uh, one is fully secured if you have any new technology or, or services enabled. So that that's, I guess, the motto that every security specialist have, so that nothing is 100% uh, secure. Um, uh, and then um, human errors, vulnerabilities uh, are always existing and technology-wise fraudsters, they also evolve. So, uh, and innovate in <laughs> brackets, you can say, new ways to attack. So. Um, so we shouldn't rely that, that such technologies uh, or solutions, what we provide or anybody else, they are kind of a bulletproof. But of course, it l always raises the bar to the next level or even further. And what typically happens, and this is, for example, a good example is that uh, when a EMB chip card started to be deployed uh, globally. So, um, I was at that time, uh, for example, in Asia Pacific, and it was interesting to see and that uh, when one country actually migrated to the chip cards from the Mac Stripe cards, the fraud actually basically moved away from that country to the next country where the Mac Stripe was this still valid. When that country then migrated to the chip card, again, the fraud migrated elsewhere. So, of course, in that, that's the business too. And you, of course, want to optimize your effort. So the fraudsters look where the, uh, let's say, the investments uh, is, is lowest and the return for that investment is the highest. Uh, it's always very dangerous to suggest that any form of fraud can be completely eliminated. So I think, you know, and it, it's best to assume that nothing you do will, will completely eliminate fraud because you need to remain, you know, vigilant. You need to keep focused on all areas, including things that you might feel you've already, you already have a solution for. Um, but, but certainly tokenization is a bit of a game changer in terms of technology. And, and you know, the way I tend to talk about it is, is this is, as long as we have a situation whereby somebody can make a payment by typing in a 16 digit, the same 16 digit number on a website or in an app in order to make a payment, that is a route by which a, uh, a fraudster can gain financial benefit from getting hold of a card, somebody's card number and then using it to buy something. So. The, the journey that we are on is effectively to, to, to take that need away, to say there will no longer be situations where people need to type in their card number. And, and that's where secure remote commerce and click to pay come in. Once we've, uh, you know, we've got rid of that experience altogether and we've tokenized the, 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 the e-commerce world, then a lot of the vulnerabilities that exist today, a lot of the means for uh, fraudsters to, to sort of monetize their activities would have been eliminated. They're eliminated. Of course, they will look for and they will find other vulnerabilities as well. But definitely that that's, that's the key focus, for, one of the biggest focuses for us today. I think what we have seen, however, is that accelerated transition into the online world and um, and interactions just generally speaking and, and how people interact with different channels now in very different ways. Um, you know, I don't think that there's the, you know, we've got the older demographics that are now shopping online. We've spoken about educating them and making sure that they're protecting themselves and that they understand how these products or payments online more generally works. I don't think that you know, I think we all know they're not as technically savvy, but as long as we educate them, I don't think there's going to be any more risk 
than what we've actually experienced previously. If anything, I think that companies and platforms like ours and the fraud technology that exists in the world now with riskifieds and and forters and businesses like that, they exist because fraud is something that people know um, is out there. And ultimately everybody, whether it's a retailer, a consumer or a platform like ours, wants to protect each other from being um, you know, exposed to, to any form of it. So I can't say we've actually seen any threats. I just think we've seen this acceleration of new adoption, but at the same time, we've seen an acceleration of platforms to protect against um, these new trends. But fraud isn't new as we all know, but the sophistication of the platforms to protect against it is now standard in most businesses. And so it's making their job harder and harder and harder. And, and my guess is that they're looking at other things that are lower hanging fruit rather than trying to beat through these really smart and sophisticated platforms that are actually doing their jobs, which is fantastic to see. There is an, at least it is up uh, um, curve uh, um, on number of transactions. People are doing much more online. I'm sure that this will be an all actually indicators if you look at this singles day in, in which has started in China or then Black Friday, which we are all very familiar now, uh, as well as the Cyber Monday. Also, that uh, the number of uh, transactions people buying online is, is going up. Uh, but at the same time, at, at least the statistics that I have seen, so they doesn't yet prove that, okay, also the fraud, number of fraud is increasing relatively uh, to those um, uh, usage numbers. It is increasing, but uh, uh, actually maybe less uh, than anticipated. Well, there could be a lot of reasons for that one. Uh, some of the fraudsters are also maybe getting more ready <laughs> for this big bang now in the Christmas time. So let's see. Um, I hope that the number of fraud is not increasing uh, uh, because this would have really severe consequences, especially these older generation customers, uh, uh, because they probably would stop using. Uh, like I could take a, from my side, my mother and her experience. So she she would uh, do probably her first online transactions roughly round about this time and uh, if there will be fraud i can guarantee she will never do online payments after that one so um and it, it is of course more difficult for the older generations um, to know also what uh, they should expect uh, or uh, what they uh, when they do online shopping i mean um it's not that many people who are really educated that you should see the small sign sign in the your browser uh, address line that there is an HTTPS, uh, for example, so that it's a secured or that you can look the content of the site and the spelling. Is it a proper local language or is it translated by Google and so on and so on. So I think that there will be challenges on that one. But uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. Uh, after Christmas, we probably know. Well, that's all we've got time for on today's episode of The Paytech Show. I would like to thank all of our guests for their time and you, the viewer at home. You can catch the rest of the series of The Paytech Show over at fintechf.com and of course, on YouTube and LinkedIn. Bye for now.